Hello, everyone. You can see people are joining. Good afternoon. We'll give it about 30 seconds and we'll kick off this launch. Welcome. Still people joining. Just reached a hundred uh, viewers. That's amazing. Welcome everyone. We'll give it another 10 seconds. Hi, good afternoon. Great. So it's 12.01. I trust that more people will be joining, but we might start. Welcome to the UN Global Compact Network Australia and our 2023 program launch. I would like to acknowledge that this presentation is being held on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. My name is Greta Courthouse. I'm the Stakeholder Engagement Manager at the UN Global Compact Network Australia. Over the next 60 minutes, you will get to hear from our workstream managers about our programmatic offering this year. Next slide, please. Let's briefly go over housekeeping. You can use the chat function to introduce yourself and to find links that we will be sharing during today's presentation. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions. If you have any technical issues, please contact us on the number that you see listed on the slide. And this session is also being recorded and will be shared with anyone who has registered. So in case you need to leave early or would like to share this, you can do that later. Feel free to send us your questions via the Q&A function anytime. We will then have a little bit of time at the end to respond to your questions. Next slide, please. Thank you. Let's look at today's agenda. We will start with an introduction to the team. Regrettably, Fiona Reynolds, our chair of the board, was unable to join us today as, as she is unwell, but she passed on a few notes that she wanted me to share on her behalf. I will also provide an overview of the UN Global Compact and the Australian Local Network. You then get the opportunity to meet our workstream managers and hear what is on offer this year. Dr. Evan Center will present on our environment and climate change offering, followed by Chris Kesky, who, who will cover human rights. Then Dan Wilcock will present on governance as well as sustainability. Together, we will then answer your questions. Next slide, please. Here you can meet the team. We are eight staff based in Melbourne, Sydney, and in Hobart. Now, allow me to share some of Fiona Reynolds' notes with you. Next slide, please, Emilia. As you may be aware, the UN Global Compact Network Australia's previous executive director, Kylie Porter, stepped down at the end of 2022. We are currently in the final stages of recruitment, and we hope to make an announcement soon. In the meantime, the team has continued to work on bringing on um, bringing an exciting 2023 program together, and we look forward to sharing, sharing that with you today. 2023 marks an important milestone as we are reaching the halfway mark to the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, a plan of action for people, planet, and prosperity embodied in the Sustainable Development Goals. This critical milestone will be an important opportunity for companies, along with other stakeholders, to announce ambitious and credible actions and targets. We expect our participants to drive positive impacts across the, trend, the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact, and today is an opportunity to see what we have in store for the year and how we can support you to advance your sustainability goals. Climate change remains the existential threat to this planet, threatens the global economy and impedes progress on the sustainable development goals. 
That's why the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has announced the Climate Ambition Summit in September and called on every leader to step up and bring new, credible, serious climate actions. The Climate Ambition Summit will convene alongside the SDG Summit in September, which aims to accelerate action at the midway point of the SDGs. We need strong, at scale, private sector leaders ready to be ambitious, innovative, and to form partnerships for the goals. Shortly, you will hear from our work stream managers, Evan, Chris, and Dan, who will share with you our confirmed programmatic activities for 2023. And now let me take you through a brief overview of our principles and goals. Next slide, please. In 1999, it was, it was the former Secretary General, General sorry, Kofi Annan who proposed to initiate a global compact of shared values and principles to give a human face to the global market. 40 companies and their CEOs signed up at that time to create what is now the UN Global Compact, and that was 23 years ago. The UN Global Compact, or UNGC, is now the world's largest corporate sustainability initiative with over 17,000 business participants. Participants commit to align their strategies and operations with the 10 principles and also commit to advance the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. The 10 principles cover human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption, and they are at the heart of the Global Compact. Next slide, please. We have identified seven focus areas, also known as our lead and shape areas, where the business community can have a strong impact. We have designed a portfolio of initiatives to help you deliver on them. They are human rights, labor and decent work, climate, cha climate change, anti-corruption, gender equality, SDG integration, which means how to integrate the SDGs across your business and how to use them for innovation purposes and transformational governance. These areas are, are at the heart of the UNGC 10 principles and the SDGs. Next slide, please. The programmatic offering of the UN Global Compact, Net Compact Network Australia covers the following key areas, anti-bribery and corruption, business and human rights, environment and climate change, and the integration of the sustainable development goals. Next slide. On this slide, um, it actually provides a good summary and overview of our activities to give you a better understanding of what we cover. Please note that some of these offerings are driven by us, the Australian Local Network, while other activities are offered in relation to or collaboration with the Global Compact Office. Like that, we ensure to convey the benefits of the global local connection and setup of the UN Global Compact. This year, we will be hosting two dialogues. I'll come back to the dates and locations for these shortly. Networking events, roundtables, inside series webinars, diving into specific topics within each of our work streams. And we are also hosting three accelerator programs. Next slide, please. Letting you know that we have a number of sponsorship opportunities this year, and there are always more opportunities arising as we build and grow our portfolio of activities. We are currently seeking sponsors for our networking evenings, roundtables, and major events. So if you're interested in sponsoring any of our events, please reach out by emailing secretariat at unglobalcompact.org.au. On the bottom of this slide, you also see a number of our past sponsors. Next slide, please. Here you see some of our global and regional flagship events. These events are complementary and open to all employees within participating organizations. With over 30,000 event attendees on an annual basis, our events offer unparalleled networking opportunities with industry leaders and peers. Events offer high-level multi-stakeholder dialogues, local knowledge and support on the implementation of strategies, as well as partnership and leadership examples. In addition to in-person experiences, 
The online access is always complementary to all participating companies and employees. On this slide, some 2023 events have been outlined. For example, the UN General Assembly High Level Week in September and as mentioned before, the SDG Summit, which is a UN event that will mark the halfway point to the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Next slide, please. Coming up locally over the next few months are these events. It's a busy slide, we know. <laughs> This week, we will be in Brisbane for our networking evening on embracing biodiversity. In about a month, applications for the Climate Ambition Accelerator will be closing, meaning you have another month to register or learn more. As always, our participants are invited to join and vote at our annual general meeting, AGM, which will be held on the 23rd of May. And you are the first ones to hear. We are offering our dialogues again this year. First up is our Australian Dialogue on Bribery and Corruption on the 18th of July in Sydney, followed by our Australian Dialogue on Business and Human Rights over two days here in Melbourne on the 29th and 30th of August. Emilia is sharing the links to our Australian events page um, as I speak. We encourage you to stay on top of our local event offerings, as well as anything coming up locally, regionally, and globally by subscribing to our monthly bulletin. The link is available now. And the next slide, please. Let's now hear from Dr. Evan Center, Manager Environment and Climate Change at UNGCNA. Evan, over to you. Great to meet you, everyone. Dialing in from Water on Country uh, here in Geelong. Um, let's get started. In the recent words of United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres, we need to act quickly to scale climate action for every country and every sector on every time frame with everything that we have got everywhere all at once. Not unlike our global and domestic landscapes, things also move quickly here for our environment and climate change team at the UN Global Compact Network Australia. And just the past seven days, for instance, both the Intergovern Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC for short, and the federal government made massive announcements. The former in its enormous sixth assessment report direly explained that we must act quickly before it's too late. And almost as if they were listening, the federal government acted and secured parliamentary support for safeguard mechanism reforms. And if that wasn't enough, today marks the final beta release, I believe it's the final beta release, uh, the new framework for the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure, TNFD reporting. And that's just the past week for us here. How's your week going? This year, as you'll see shortly, we're doing our best to drive home those words of Sec Secretary General Guterres. We are giving everything that we have to facilitate the climate actions that our environment demands and we're acting as quickly as we can. In 2023, we are on target to at least double our output from last year. And we're doing some big things in terms of programming, thought leadership and participant engagement, especially on the topics of decarbonization, biodiversity, circularity, supply chain management, and the just transition for climate adaptation. We're acting quickly to drive important conversations, engage our participants at the very highest level to engage you and amplify your voices as the voices of climate action. So let's take a look at what we're offering this year in our environment and climate change programming. First, we have an explicit emphasis on helping businesses decarbonize and achieve net zero emissions as quickly as possible. And there are two ways that we're doing this. Building off the success of last year, we are delivering our 2023 Climate Ambition Accelerator. No matter where your organization is in their sustainability journey, the Climate Ambition Accelerator equips businesses to quickly deliver science-based emissions targets that are aligned with a 1.5 degree pathway. In order to reduce emissions at scale, the Climate Ambition Accelerator supports organizations of all sizes, sectors, and regions. And while we have global support from WSP, which is super exciting, our local network track of the Climate Ambition Accelerator offers bonus support, and I'm even more excited about this, and expertise from both Point Advisory and ERM Company and ThinkStep AMZ. 
For those interested, we just started our accelerator recruitment, as Greta mentioned earlier. The deadline for signing up is on the 30th of April. We'll also be holding an information session via our global office this week. Spots are limited and participation will be granted on a first and best dress basis. So if this would be helpful for your organization, act quickly. Second, we are working in partnership with Deloitte to deliver four net zero roundtables, which will focus on operationalizing net zero. The roundtables will offer high level keynotes, peer discussion, industry driving panels and workshops by Deloitte. They'll also be spread throughout the country and calendar year, starting in Perth and then moving to Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne. In addition to delivering on decarbonization, we're engaging with a number of other important environment and climate change trends. In February, we delivered a joint parliamentary submission on climate-related financial disclosure. Less than two weeks ago in Sydney, we held our first event of the year, Biodiversity and Business, a networking evening, and it sold out. The sunset was absolutely beautiful in our location. It was a, an amazing night, and we're hosting another event this Thursday in Brisbane that I believe if, I, if I'm right, has literally one ticket left. So again, stay on, stay on with us, but act quickly. Continuing on the topic of biodiversity, we're organizing a special insight series webinar engagement opportunity for the Task Force and Nature Related Financial Disclosure, or TNFD reporting. We're also planning on adding other stellar webinars on pertinent topics such as circularity and pa packaging and the lead up to the next and 28th session of the Conference of Parties. Finally, in addition to engaging our participants with important information, environment, and climate change trends, we're driving thought leadership for climate action. Notably, we'll soon be finalizing our publication on sustainable supply chain management, which we've been developing in partnership with EY. As we wrap it up, I'd like to thank our local network participants who have, whom have given us valuable interviews from their supply chain management process, their expertise, and their time to make this publication happen. Thank you so much. We'll also be developing other smaller publications, blogs, and bite-sized learning programming to supplement our engagement with climate reporting and circularity while capitalizing on other new and emerging thought leadership topoi, if you will. So in conclusion, we are acting quickly in order to lead conversations, scale up your engagement, and amplify your voices, the voices of those that are tuned in right now, the voices are of those that are also acting quickly for climate action. And there's a lot to do. So we need you to be a part of what we're doing, whether that's signing up for the Climate Ambition Accelerator, getting your organization involved, attending and partnering with us on programming like our networking evenings and roundtables, or simply engaging in our online programming, peer-to-peer -peer workshops, and fantastic Global Academy offerings. We need you to drive climate action in your teams. These challenging and exciting times for our environment and climate change program team, they're a lot, but we're optimistic, we're stoked, and we're supporting you, and we're just getting started. So thank you for acting quickly. Please engage with us. I'm happy to support however we can, and I'll turn it over to Chris to discuss some of the exciting things that his, his team is doing with business and human rights programming. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, Evan. Good afternoon, everybody. Wonderful to be with you all today. And it's great to see so many familiar names on the list of attendees. I uh, hope 2023 has started well for all of you. Um, my name is Chris Kasky. I look after the human rights programming here at the UN Global Compact Network in Australia. Um, for those of you that I haven't met yet, I am an international human rights lawyer, uh, later turned consultant and now program manager. Um, and our stream uh, essentially helps businesses to meet the human rights and labour rights commitments under the UN Global Compact. I'm dialing in from Gadigal Country this afternoon, and I'd, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present, as well as those emerging community leaders. And of course, being the uh, the team member that's in Sydney, um, if any participants are here and you'd like to reach out for a coffee, I'm always uh, always open for a brief brew in the morning. Um, now to kick this off, I'd just like to briefly chat through a couple of business and human rights trends that we're seeing both in the international space as well as in the market in Australia as it really sort of helps to tee up some of the programming that we've set up in the business and human rights stream. And so the first, as I'm sure you're aware, is a continued focus on modern slavery risk management and remediation. So of course, the Modern Slavery Act in Australia has really driven a strong business response on integrating human rights within business. Um, and it's really paved the way for what's essentially set up business and human rights frameworks within Australian companies. 
And we know a lot of uh, leading members of the UN Global Compact in Australia have done an extraordinary amount of work in this space. Um, a number of uh, companies are actually starting to really progress their efforts in remediating some of the high-risk due diligence uh, findings that they've uncovered. And as many of you will also know, last year, we assisted the Attorney General's Department uh, in facilitating conversations on the review of the Modern Slavery Act. So as I'm sure you, you are all uh, also eagerly awaiting, uh, we are eagerly awaiting the report from Professor McMillan, which I think is due this Friday. Um, we may not see the light of it for a couple of months now, but as soon as we have any information on that, we will look to engage uh, all of you. The second trend that I just want to highlight is this: is what I'm calling a rapidly increasing focus on the how in terms of engaging with at-risk, vulnerable or marginalised groups. And I think we're seeing that effective stakeholder or rights holding engagement now really carries an empowerment focus. It's almost an understanding that there's a power imbalance between companies and rights holders. And this means that companies are really putting a lot more effort into understanding how to engage safely, respectfully, and also educating rights holders about what their rights are in a culturally accessible manner. And within Australia, of course, we've seen an increased focus on uh, the protection of First Nations cultural heritage over the past couple of years, and in particular with, with current discussions um, on Indigenous Voice to Parliament, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. But this how question is really sort of transposed into a number of other thematic areas. For instance, we've seen companies that are now looking at their diversity and inclusion or workplace harassment programs through an increasingly human rights focus. The third trend I want to highlight is an increasing convergence on human rights and the environment. And as many of you will know, the UN formally recognized the human right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment back in October 2021. I think companies are now sort of beginning to understand what operationalizing that right means in practice, and in particular what that means for other priorities in their business and areas like decarbonization. But I suppose more often than not, we're seeing that it requires an industry approach and that and that also requires cross industry collaboration. And so initiatives like the UN Global Compact are really key to connecting businesses with certain uh, civil society voices and then also connecting them with each other so they can get that industry collaboration and highlighting areas of highest risk and exerting leverage collectively. And fourth and finally, there are a million different trends, but I'll, I'll keep it to four, um, is the impact of regulatory movement overseas and international events. So as I'm sure many of you will know, business and human rights related laws have now come into effect in a number of jurisdictions, including France, Germany, Norway, and Switzerland. And there are obviously a, a number more that are contemplated in nearly uh, 10 other countries around the world. And this is happening at the same time as businesses are eagerly watching what the EU is doing as part of the ongoing debate with the EU Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. I think many of our participants, and in particular uh, those with a global reach, are really, really now considering how to best align their responsible sourcing frameworks across multiple jurisdictions. And as we as we go throughout this process, it's really going to mean which is the most protective for rights holders, as this largely allows you to comply with the most stringent requirements over, or sorry, the less stringent requirements overseas. But at the same time as that. There's disruption for companies that have operations or suppliers in territories experiencing armed conflict in you know, areas such as Myanmar, Ukraine, or Russia. But these companies are now facing pressure to consider their next steps in a rights-respecting way, whether that means exiting or it means maintaining a presence to assist a particularly vulnerable group. So now with that regulatory landscape sort of taking form, um, some of these events have really shone a light on the business and human rights complexities for transnational companies, all the way from increased human rights risks for women and girls in Afghanistan, to talking through union and collective bargaining in the United Arab Emirates, um, or to try and integrate a, 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 essentially an LGBTIQ plus diversity inclusion framework in companies in places like Africa. So a lot of uh, complexity and a lot of challenge, but also, of course, a lot of opportunity to improve uh, human rights outcomes for a lot of people around the world. I'll just turn over to the next slide to talk you through what that looks like in terms of our programming. So as many of you may already be aware, we split our business and human rights work stream into three key thematic areas. And the first one looks at the implementation of the UN guiding principles uh, on business and human rights within Australian businesses. The second one looks at assisting Australian businesses with identifying, assessing, managing or mitigating modern slavery risks that are present within their operations and within their supply chains. And the third one is enabling business to engage with First Nations stakeholders in a safe, effective and rights-respecting way. And I'll talk through that a little bit more about this in a second. 
So first up on a UNGP integration. So we're currently about halfway through our inaugural Business and Human Rights Accelerator program. Um, this is being delivered by our global experts Shift with support from Business and Human Rights Consultancy Pillar 2. Um, in this program, we're taking what's just under 30 companies now through an end-to-end -end creation of an end-to-end -end human rights due diligence process. And we've had a lot of really good feedback on the program so far. We will be running another one next year. So if you'd like to, uh, if you'd like to be involved next year, please let me know and we'll give you all the info. Shortly, we'll be sending out uh, invitations for the launch of our latest publication, which is titled Reducing Emissions and Respecting Human Rights. This will be launched in Sydney on April 26th, um, and we've uh, been pulling this together in collaboration with EY. It's a very cool piece of work in which we're actually trying to integrate respect for human rights into the decarbonisation uh, process and doing that sort of uh, process step by process step. It is uh, SME focused, so we've had to challenge ourselves quite a bit to simplify it. Um, but the process is still relevant for larger companies if you'd like to if you'd like to take a look. Um, next up in May, we'll be beginning our Insight Series webinars. And the first one will focus on the Indigenous Voice to Parliament, and in particular, the work that leading Australian participants have done to internalize uh, internally mobilize support for the Yes campaign, in addition to educating their teams on what the referendum means for them. So keep an eye out for invites for that one as well. And also in May, we will be facilitating a conversation with the UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Slavery in Melbourne, Mr. Professor Tomoya Obakata. So very excited to have him down for the RIA conference. Um, and that will be on Melbourne, oh, sorry, on May 9th, I believe. And of course, uh, we will be holding our flagship event, the Australian, or BHR flagship event, sorry guys, um, the Australian Dialogue on Business and Human Rights, which will be held on the 29th and the 30th of August in Melbourne, um, with kind support from a participant and law firm, Cause Chambers Westgarth. So I'll just turn to our modern slavery programming now. So for those of you that aren't aware, um, the UNGCNA hosts a modern slavery community of practice, and this is essentially uh, uh, a community that's designed to assist Australian businesses in identifying modern slavery risks within their operations and their supply chains to share and to work collaboratively on building best practice across the market. And last year, due to interest, um, we actually had to split the stream into three separate streams. And we now have an optimizing stream for the leading entities, an implementing stream for those that are still <clears throat> standing up their response, and an SME stream for those who don't have to report, but they're actually very interested in modern slavery. Um, it, we get a lot of really good feedback on this. And so if you are interested and you're a participant of ours and you're not part of the MSCOP, please let me know and I'll get you involved. Secondly, we're also pulling together a number of publications over the coming months. We'll be pulling one together looking at high-risk due diligence findings and how to report this to the AFP. We'll also be pulling another one together that helps SMEs with their own modern slavery work. Um, but we're also pulling together a larger publication looking at modern slavery due diligence and beyond. So our friends at Pillar 2 will be helping with this, and this will be a case study publication. So participants on the line, if you have interesting case studies on modern slavery or broader human rights due diligence and you'd like to contribute these to our publication, please let me know and I'll get those built in. And these, of course, join our, our fantastic other range of publications that we already have on our website in terms of pulling together agreements, mechanisms, or managing modern slavery associated with maritime shipping. Also, as a number of you may have seen me uh, posting quite a bit about on LinkedIn, um, we are also releasing a series of bite-sized learning modules on key modern slavery risk issues for Australian businesses. And I get the very fun job of going and meeting uh, leading experts to have these uh, interesting conversations on camera, which is very cool. Um, but if you're looking for a small sort of piece of training that you'd like to distribute to your team, whether it's on something like maritime shipping risk, whether it's on human rights due diligence, whether it's on what actually does due diligence mean, um, these are a really good resource. And you can find all of our modern slavery work on our Modern Slavery Impacts Initiative website, um, which we'll be dropping into the chat shortly. And finally, in May, um, we will also be holding our, our last Modern Slavery Collabor Collaborator Roundtable as part of our Modern Slavery Impact Initiative. So May will be bringing together our leaders from civil society, business and government to discuss the impact of emerging human rights uh, due diligence on Australian companies. And finally, but uh, last but not least, we are continuing our close partnership with the First Nations Heritage Protection Alliance and also the Responsible Investment Association of Australia, Australasia rather, um, on the Delta Nillan Business and Invest Investor Initiative. Now, this initiative was established in the wake of the disruption of Jukun Gorge in Western Australia, and it really sees the protection and celebration of cultural heritage as the responsibility of all Australians. And the key question for us was really, how do we mobilize the expectations of companies and investors as contemplated in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in an Australian specific way? 
So in this initiative, we're preparing guidance material on this exact question. So we're working with a leading expert in this field, Dr. Terry Janke, um, who's developing standards based off the original uh, Dalwood and Nillan Best Practice Cultural Heritage Guidance uh, for the management of cultural heritage. So if you're a company and you are engaging with First Nations stakeholders and you'd like to be involved in this process, um, we're currently in consultation stage on the guidance material. So please let me know and I'll be able to send it to you as soon as I can. We'd love to get your thoughts. And of course, if you do have any other questions on uh, anything Dara Nillan related, please feel free to let me know. Um, as I'm sure you've seen, you know, one of the real challenges in business and human rights and all of our streams is really the shifting priorities and, and a recognition that we can always do more. So whether it's labor rights, whether it's gender equality, and as, as Greta mentioned earlier, um, we do pivot a lot to assist companies in responding to the latest events and latest trends. So there are a number of things in train that we can't announce today, but this is sort of where we, we're at at the moment in terms of the BHR stream. I am uh, very hopeful that a lot of this work will go a long way towards assisting companies with their commitments under the UN Global Compact 10 principles. And with that, I think we'll take questions at the end. I will pass on to Dan to give us an overview of governance and sustainability. Over to you, Dan. Thanks so much, Chris. Good morning, good afternoon all, depending on where you happen to be located right now. I'm joining from Lutruwita, otherwise known as Tasmania. Um, so uh, just hit afternoon here. Um, I think I had a scroll through the, the chat function as, as some of my colleagues were, were going through some of the great programming coming ahead. I feel like, um, I'm guessing some of you feel like you're at a bit of an all-you-can-eat buffet. Um, there's, there's been a hell of a lot that, that you've uh, taken in from, uh, from Evan and Chris, and I'm just hoping that I can uh, whet your appetite to find, you know, get in some more uh, uh, nutrition here or find that elusive second stomach for dessert. So um, I'll, I'll cover the governance and sustainability work streams today. Um, just by way of introduction, for those I haven't uh, yet had the chance to meet, um, I joined UN Global Compact Network Australia late last year um, as Sustainability and Governance Manager, and my background um, is, is in both those areas, so on the governance side with law enforcement in Australia and Canada on corporate criminality, antitrust, consumer protection areas, and uh, I moved on to international work with the Canadian government, particularly at the Environment Ministry, uh, working at UN Environment Assembly, um, OECD, and, and other multilateral um, bodies there. I also want to give a quick shout out to my colleague, uh, Nick O'Sullivan, who might be able to raise his virtual hand so you can uh, see him, put a face to the name. So Nick and I are partners in crime in, in both these areas, although and um, that's probably the wrong analogy given we're talking anti-corruption work too but um so uh with that um as you've heard from both chris and evan a lot of what we're trying to do with this all you can eat buffet is is uh get the right items uh onto the buffet for you at the right time um and uh so the, there is some adaptation uh going on as we're uh as issues, new issues emerge throughout the year and, and trends that Chris touched on some good ones there. So uh, let's give you a flavor of, of what's to come and uh, recognize that we'll, we'll do our best to change up the menu as, as the needs require. So on bribery, bribery prevention and governance, we can click through to the, that slide there now. Um, so sometimes we also refer to it as anti-bribery and corruption, and we're an acronym-rich uh, organization. So I apologize if we slip into it, to um, all of those again. But uh, essentially on bribery prevention and governance, the 10th principle of the Global Compact um, states that businesses should work against corruption in all forms, including extortion and bribery. And uh, so that principle uh, aligns also with the UN Convention Against Corruption, which is the only internationally um, legally binding universal instrument in, in this space. So really, this work stream is about supporting companies to develop policies and programs um, that address corruption, not just to protect your own businesses, but uh, really to protect the interests of, of other stakeholders and uh, society as a whole, including achieving the SDGs. So 
uh, the really the the flagship event in this space is um, as you heard is the Australian dialogue on bribery and corruption. Um, this will be the eighth dialogue on on uh, bribery and corruption, and uh, part of its real success has been the format uh, which adopts Chatham House rules. So that really uh, enables frank and insightful exchanges of the dialogue. Um, our participants have found a lot of value in that. Um, and so the rotation this year puts it in Sydney on the 18th of July um, and delivered in partnership with, with Allens. Again, we're grateful for their continuing support and expertise in, in the space. So really the dialogue always seeks to address um, emerging legal and operational risks, uh, the Australian reform agenda and the enforcement environment. And uh, it won't surprise you talking about trends that all, all those things continue to evolve as uncertain economic conditions, uh, green transition, et cetera, continue. Uh, and, and we have uh, things on the horizon, such as the launch of the new National Anti-Corruption Anti Commission in the middle of the year. So you can be sure the, the agenda will explore a number of those relevant topics. So we expect uh, invitations to go out uh, likely in May with registration starting then. So stay tuned for that. The, the second piece on this slide here is something I'm, I'm particularly excited about um, in terms of uh, some of the programming to, to tackle other emerging issues in bribery and corruption. And uh, we're, we're planning to host roundtables in August in Brisbane and Melbourne on integrity and opportunity in the business of sport. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've noticed we're, we're entering an arc of major international sports events in Australia over the next um, 10 years or so, I've heard referred to as the green and gold decade. Um, so uh, not too long now till FIFA Women's World Cup kicks off in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we've got the Commonwealth Games happening in Victoria in 2026. Uh, we've got the Netball World Cup in 27, uh, T20 World Cup in 28, Women's Rugby World Cup in 29. I think I skipped the Men's World Cup in 27 there. And then, of course, that, that other thing, the uh, Olympics and Paralympics in Brisbane in 2032. So it's really, it's really an unusual period. Um, and uh, of major international sports events with a, with a global focus on Australia. Now, having said that, unfortunately, there's, there's a history of corruption impacting on, on major sports events around the world. Um, it won't surprise you that the delivery of infrastructure and services um, faces uh, serious risks of, of corruption and misconduct in a circumstance with, with so much visibility and time pressures, et cetera. So really the goal of the roundtables is to bring together a, a range of interested stakeholders to anticipate, prevent and, and manage fraud, bid rigging and corruption risks. Um, really so that taxpayers get maximum positive legacies out of, out of these events and their investments and so that Brand Australia isn't tarnished by corruption and misconduct as, as we've seen unfortunately in a number of other locations. So those roundtables will bring together governments, sport organisations, uh, businesses, civil society to, to discuss the challenges and ways to ensure um, there are effective cultures of compliance uh, through, throughout hosting all these events. So again, uh, stay tuned for uh, more information on those and we'd, we'd love to see um, your participation if, if uh, that's of interest to you. Uh, again, emerging issues, as I said before, putting other things on the menu um, so uh, we'll, we'll be announcing webinars, both uh, uh, insight series kind of webinars and within the BPN on uh, new and emerging issues in the space, uh, again, such as the launch of the NACC. Now, the Bribery Prevention Network, um, the, third, the third thing on this list really, is uh, a, a fascinating, it's, it's really a wonderful institution that, that maybe not all of you have uh, had the chance to interact with. So just very, the, excuse me, the brief one-on-one on that really emerged from the Raising the Bar Forum in 2019. And it's a collection, a collective action initiative um, that brings together again, government, corporate civil society and academic organizations um, aiming to prevent, detect and address bribery. And, and um, the network has a particular focus on the bribery of foreign uh, public officials. 
So some of the partners in that include the Australian Federal Police, the Attorney General's Department, uh, Westpac, Minerals Council of Australia, KPMG, Transparency International. There's a lot of expertise around the table. I haven't been able to mention them all. But uh, UNGCNA, we, we act as the host organization for the BPN. So again, there's a, there's a busy uh, calendar for 2023, uh, a range of webinars and events. Um, we, we have a deep bench to draw upon to, con to continue sporting analogies, I guess. We have a deep bench to draw upon um, for, for expertise and speakers on, on emerging issues there. Um, so, for example, uh, we're, we're locking in a date now for May for a webinar on supply chain transparency. In this context, it has a particular focus on um, preventing bribery and corruption, but obviously supply chains um, and transparency issues span all, all the areas we've heard about today. And that one will have particular insight from Export Finance Australia. So uh, recommend the bribery prevention network to the, the web addresses on that slide. And uh, we, we call that the, the hub um, for a whole range of fantastic free resources uh, for, for anyone navigating these spaces in their world. So with that, I'll switch over to the uh, sustainable development work stream. And uh, just to, to set the scene, for sustainable development, because isn't that what we've been talking about this whole time? Well, yes, good observation. Um, so um, this, this work stream was, was introduced really um, to focus on SDG integration into strategies and operations of Australian businesses and uh, to, to tackle some of the cross-cutting and overarching issues in a way that Evan and Chris uh, just haven't had the time and the bandwidth uh, to do. So that's that's the goal of what we're working on there is um, tackling a few other issues. So I'll touch on what those look like. But uh, the SDG Ambition Accelerator up top there, um, it's really a key program in, in this sort of integration space. Um, it's It's been a popular uh, popular program so far, six months long, um, supporting companies to uh, set ambitious corporate targets and really accelerate the incorporation of SDGs into core business management. So uh, we have our third cohort in the accelerator underway at the moment, led ably by, by Nick, who is there somewhere, and uh, delivered in close partnership with, with Accenture, who's been fantastic. It's really exciting to see um, the range of SDG benchmarks that, that uh, probably a number of you on the call and, and your colleagues on the call are, are developing now across climate, environment, water management, net positive water targets, human rights topics, gender equity, et cetera, and, and really wrestling with how to um, incorporate um, those issues into their, into their own context and, and uh, organizations. So if you're interested in getting a further flavor about that um, and, and the sort of outcomes, then take a look at the publication. Um, and if Amelia is able, she might be able to pop up a link for a recent publication, shining a light on the SDGs and Australian business approach. There are some pretty cool case studies that came out of the last cohort of the Ambition Accelerator. And then looking forward, so that one will, will wrap up middle of the year. And uh, we're, we're considering at the moment whether we'll run another round of the SDG Ambition Accelerator in its current form. We're exploring some other exciting possibilities as well, um, whether it's some programming uh, uh, in sustainable finance space, excuse me, or um, a community of practice around sustainability reporting, which we know a lot of, uh, a lot of you are wrestling with. Um, so we, we may, decide in fact to go deeper in one of those specific topics with, with our program offering to be announced later in the year. Now in the sustainable finance space, um, so I think we all recognize that achieving the SDGs is really going to be heavily reliant upon um, private sector's ability to, to make investments and tackle the most um, urgent social and environmental challenges um, through uh, directing of finance in appropriate ways. So um, the CFO Coalition for the SDGs is an initiative driven from, from New York, from our headquarters there, which is really aiming to, to support businesses reorienting their investments towards sustainable development. 
and uh, that uh, it really starts from from uh, developing a whole common sort of vocabulary, language, ambitions, targets, benchmarks, and resources for CFOs around the world uh, to start tackling these questions. So. Um, the, the CFO coalition, as it's set up at the moment, has a leadership group um, and a signatories group um, with, with different levels of involvement in the initiative. And uh, we certainly recommend that, uh, recommend that program to anyone who may have uh, a CFO who's interested in uh, the area and the, and the team with the ability to, to contribute to that and learn from the coalition. So uh, I think one of the great experiences we've seen was um, Ian Wells, the CFO from Fortescue Metals Group, is part of the leadership group for the CFO Coalition, and uh, he represented uh, Fortescue Metals Group at the SDG Investment Forum last year in New York City um, for an exchange of views about how corporate investment finance can really contribute to achieving the SDGs. At that, he happened to announce US $6.2 billion investment to eliminate fossil fuel risk and uh, reduce their operating costs. It was somewhere around US $800 million a year by, by 2030. So some again, some excellent inspiration and examples on the sustainable finance side. Then moving to the third piece here, the emerging and cross-cutting SDG issues. One thing, if, if you haven't heard talk about it yet, you're going to hear me and others talking about it uh, over the rest of the course of this year, halfway to Agenda 2030. Um, so uh, when Agenda 2030 was uh, agreed back in 2015, it seemed, it seemed like a you know, fair chunk of time. Um, uh, until we got to 2030, it seemed a bit uh, far away and abstract, but this year marks the halfway point to Agenda 2030. So as you heard from Greta at the opening, there's really going to be a, a focus at, at the uh, leaders, con the UN uh, General Assembly, the Leaders Summit in September, um, a stock take of how we're going and, uh, you know, spoiler alert, we're not going so great. Um, you know, the um, the pandemic, amongst other things, has set us uh, further back off course. And so we will be uh, developing programming around uh, you know, this, this stock take concept to assess where we are and to really um, refocus and re-energize ourselves on, on uh, achieving progress towards the SDGs in, in the second half. Um, it's sporting again. It's always sports. Um, so... Um, with that, um, you know, look out for programming. Uh, it will take a, a few different forms, really leveraging um, uh, of the, the summit in New York in September. So uh, again, some other, we're trying to um, contribute and, and support uh, all of you as participants on a range of other emerging issues uh, where we can. Um, we've done, we did some work, uh, for example, on, on the a plastic submission. Uh, on plastic pollution in, in oceans and waterways in Australia. Uh, Nick did a great piece on uh, innovations in the seaweed and algae uh, sector, which is exciting, and how that can feed into everyone's work in, in uh, throughout their supply chains and trying to achieve the SDGs. Um, so uh, a couple areas to, to signal for sure the evolving landscape of ESG disclosures and Evan touched on that with things like DNFD and, and the whole alphabet soup that, that everybody is uh, wrestling to, to uh, stay on top of. Um, and greenwashing is another um, really big theme that, that uh, we're hearing about uh, from every direction. And so um, we're, we're doing a range of, of work on greenwashing, working with the ACCC and ASIC, and um, we will be releasing guidance uh, later in the year on, uh, on navigating, uh, traversing this space of, of increased ESG reporting and statements without crossing the line into greenwashing, bluewashing, SDG washing, uh, or any other form of corporate whitewashing. Um, and uh, we will be reaching out to engage with any of you who've had experience in this space um, recently and, and want to share that experience with us so as part of the dialogue with uh, the regulators and um, also in developing principles-based guidance for the membership. So I will leave it at, leave it at that. Uh, again, lots on that dessert part of the menu, but uh, hopefully, hopefully something there piques your interest. And I think we now move to the question. Yes, look at that, the question period of the agenda. 
fantastic. Thank you so much, Dan, Evan, and Chris. What a comprehensive overview. Um, I really think that uh, had everything in it that we're currently uh, planning or con have confirmed or is in the pipeline. So um, I hope you found this informative. A few questions have come through during this presentation, which uh, have been answered in writing, but I can just see um, there's a few now all have been answered. So over to you, the audience, um, to see if there's any further questions at the moment. While you might be typing, let me just respond to one of those questions that have come through that might be of interest to um, non-participants. So if you are not a current member, we say participants of the Global Compact, um, some of our offering, offerings are available to you. However, the question came through about our Ambition Accelerator programs and whether you have to be a participant to join those. And the answer is yes, you do. Um, joining is fairly easy. You join on the global level first by submitting an online application, including your letter of commitment. The review of this application takes roughly two to three weeks. And once your, your organization is approved, you can join us on the local network level here in Australia, and I'll be reaching out to you for that. And once you have joined us at the UNGCNA, you can um, obviously sign up to accelerator programs and any of the other offerings. There's a question that has just come through. I note the first three bite-sized learning pieces available for free on the UNGCNA website around aspects of human rights and modern slavery. When is the next one released and how many will there be? May I throw this to the programs team? <laughs> no, that's that's a fantastic question. So there are three currently reflecting on the website. Um, I filmed two last week and there'll be an additional, uh, what's that? There'll be an additional three after those two that we just filmed. So there's three more coming between now and the end of June. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. And thanks, Robin, for this really good question. Raja just asked, um, can an individual join the group? Um, you can't as an individual. Um, it's a, We are the world's, world's largest corporate sustainability initiative. So we are focused on the private sector and also work with civil society, academia and business associations. So the non-business um, sector, however, um, it's not an initiative for individuals as such, Raja. Any other questions from anyone at the moment? You're welcome. Um, there was a question around the communication on progress um, that might be of interest to participants and non-participants. So the, the one requirement the participants have on an annual basis is the submission of your communication on progress, um, which um, is done uh, at the same time. It's a universal submission period for all participants um, every year, and it's from March until the 30th of June every year. Now, this new universal submission period and the enhanced communication on progress through a questionnaire has been introduced this year. So this is year one. And um, due to a technical delay, um, the new platform has been released yesterday on the 27th and is now available to all participants. So in case you've been trying to log in to submit your COP, it is now possible to access, to access the new digital platform. And you've got until the end of June to do so, unless you are a subsidiary to an overseas parent organization. In that case, your headquarters will be submitting your COP. I can see another question has come through. I see that Chris is typing an answer to this one. It's a, it's a, um, there's a question around universities in Australia um, who are struggling to negotiate, negotiate for the latest EBA. Um, don't you think this is a form of modern slavery in the corporate Australia? Um, I am honest and I cannot answer this question. So um, I'm not sure, Chris, would you like to talk to this or type an answer to this question? Um, it's potentially something that we should uh, discuss offline. It's when we when we work with modern slavery, in particular with Australian uh, companies, we're talking about a very specific set of criteria that sits on the you know the very extreme end of exploitation. Um, but I can I can pick up that question offline. Amazing, thank you. Jessica just asked, can someone from the team please share the list of events via email or share this presentation? Yes, absolutely, Jessica. Everyone who has registered will be 
receiving a thank you email, including an overview of the events that have been confirmed and a link to the recording of today's session. We also encourage everyone who hasn't done so yet to subscribe to our bulletin, which is a monthly newsletter that uh, keeps you on top of everything that's coming up uh, locally, regionally, and globally that is of relevance to our participants. Are you providing any performance assessment for member organizations based on the UNGC assessment tool? Well, um, that is a fabulous question. So the communication on progress I just mentioned is a requirement that all participants have to um, fulfill, if you will. So you have to submit this every year. Um, but it's important to say that it's not a standard. There's, it's not a performance assessment tool. It's a tool to disclose your progress and let us know where your organization is at um, in terms of the 10 principles and the SDGs. So it's important to say that there is no pass or fail as such. Um, however, we do do benchmarking in the background because this data obviously gives a lot of information about the private sector and where it is at um, in terms of its progress um, uh, towards the SDGs. So we use this information in the background to then be able to address any gaps, but also to identify thought leadership and get our participants to, for example, speak at events and talk about how they address specific issues, topics, and challenges. Um, Jessica asked, will there be any CEO or C-suite level engagement events at any point? Yes. Um, and not, Dan, would you be able to talk to the um, coalition for the SDGs at this, at this stage? Is that something that um, would cover this? Yeah, so look, I think uh, in terms of this, obviously C-suite um, participation is welcome in, in any of the programming uh, along with everyone else. But in terms of uh, particularly targeted in the Australian context, uh, there's nothing coming to mind immediately that's solely reserved for, for C-suite. Um, some of the programming on the bribery prevention network side, we are looking at that. But uh, internationally, um, yeah, the CEO co coalition, the CFO coalition for the SDGs, et cetera, are, are very specific programs, and we're happy to furnish some more information on, on either of those if they're of interest. Thank you very much, Dan. That's a very good point, Jessica. So um, when you look at our website and the global website and you are interested in any of these, um, just letting you know that our coalitions are by invitation only and are being run by the global office, the Global Compact Office, GCO. However, if you are interested, um, please reach out to me. I have shared my email address earlier. I can do it again in the chat box. Um, so I can get you in touch and um, we can, for example, set up a call and talk about these um, opportunities and any questions you might have. Obviously, all our, of our offerings, so the Academy, anything you've heard about today, is um, available to all participants and all employees. So we, we don't really sort of distinguish there. However, there's obviously sometimes events where, um, you know, more senior um, staff members sort of um, uh, would be more appropriate to attend. Um, but I think um, what Dan just outlined is a good point in, in principle. Um, everyone is invited to join. Um, we have a question around um, the login to the account and there's an error that has occurred. So if you could please reach out to me directly, I can assist with that. Um, that sometimes can happen. I will share my email address again in the chat box right now so you can reach out to me directly. Any other questions? Any other questions from anyone? I'm just having my email address. I can't see anything else come through at the moment. We are at 58, so we have two minutes to go. Um, if there's nothing else, thank you, Jessica. If there's nothing else coming through, oh, are there any additional fees associated with the accelerator programs? Yes, there are. Um, and these depend on the organization type. So whether you are a small to medium um, enterprise or a larger corporate organization, the fees vary slightly. So please, again, reach out to me via email and I can give you an overview. Um, and as a reminder, the next accelerator program is our Climate Ambition Accelerator um, and the 
due date for registration, sorry, the, the deadline for registration is in one month on the 30th of April. Is that right, Evan? 30th? Yep, yep, that is correct. Amazing. Um, thank you, everyone. What about startup business fee? There's one last question. Um, as a startup, you would likely fall into the SME category. So um, please reach out to me. I can share the fee structure with you via email as well as further information about the benefits of joining. Thank you very much for your attendance. Um, we had some special guests today. So it was lovely to uh, virtually, well, we didn't really see anyone because we're in a webinar, but it was lovely to see your questions and your, um, um, your contributions. Uh, thanks, everyone. Have a lovely afternoon. And uh, please reach out if you have any further questions. We are happy to help.